Great is the Lord, and great things to be praised. We welcome you to the sanctuary of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church of Memphis, Tennessee. God has blessed us to gather again to just worship and praise his name. And for that, we are indeed thankful. Please join us in our call to worship. Come to worship Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. We come to worship the one who rules justly. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the king, kings of the earth. Bread of heaven, God with us, good shepherd, true vine. Eternal word, great I am. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. We come to worship Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We will now be led further in worship by the St. James of Praise Team.
for your amazing grace. Thank you, O oh God, for your love. Thank you, O oh God, for our health and strength. Thank you, O oh God, for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you, O oh God, for watching over us last night. Thank you, O oh God, for food on the table, clothes on our back. We thank you, O oh God, for the life that you've given us, God, not just this earthly life, but, oh God, you've given us the opportunity for everlasting life. In your word, you said that you came that we may have life and have it in more abundance. And so, oh God, we touch up to heaven right now and we grab down that abundant life, the blessings that can only grow from you. Dear God, we ask you to enter into us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to be yet vessels during the season of Thanksgiving, not looking at what 2020 has taken away from us, but what 2020 still yet means. Looking forward to the coming days and, and weeks and months and all of the promises that you have yet to fulfill. God, we look to the hills from which cometh our help, and we know that if we yet only give thanks, if we yet cry out to heaven, you will hear us. And so, oh God, we're serving you knowing you're a hearing God, you're a providing God, you're a loving God, you're a kind God, you're a blessing God, you're a promise keeper, you're a heavy load bearer, oh God. Your burden, your burden is, is, is light, your yoke is easy. Oh God, we thank you right now for the promises that you are yet to keep to us, and we ask that you give us the provision, the protection, and that we praise our way through to see them. Thank you, Lord. God, bless this service. Bless those that are watching. Bless the pastor as he comes forth. God, we look to you. And we thank you. We worship you. And we say in your son Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. amen. This morning, the scripture lesson comes from the 95th number of Psalm, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Somebody write in the comments, salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Say, thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Somebody yeah, say, yeah. joyful noise. For the Lord is great God. The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Yeah, yeah. His hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And the dry land which his hands have borne. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. May God add a blessing to all of you that have joined us. Amen.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord. And when we give thanks, we realize that God's spirit will enter into the atmosphere because we need God's spirit. Hallelujah. The Lord is indeed great and does marvelous things. We are so thankful today to join you once again. Today is the final installment of the preaching, teaching series, Leaders After God's Heart. Our first uh, sermon was about being an able person, and the character we talked about was Abigail, and then we talked about fearing God, and then we spoke about being trustworthy. Then to today, our last characteristic we're going to highlight in leaders in the church, both uh, preacher, clergy, and lay, is hates dishonest gain. So today, join me in 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to begin at verse 20, then I'm going to move down to verse 25. 2 Kings 5, beginning at verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, My master has let that Aramean Naaman off too lightly by not accepting from him what he offered. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something out of him. Verse 25, he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? He answered, your servant has not gone anywhere at all. But he said to him, did I not go with you in spirit when someone left his chariot to meet you? Is this a time to accept money and to accept clothing, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, and male and female slaves. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he left his presence leprous, as white as snow. And for a theme today, I want to use money or ministry. Money or ministry. Our society, many people in our society have made an idol out of money. Uh, we, people, we hear people say money makes the world go round, and there's a little bit of truth to that. There was also a movie made about 20 years ago called All About the Benjamins. And if you scan social media, if you look on Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter or Facebook, sometimes you see young men taking selfies, flashing thousands of dollars in an effort to prove something to the world. For many, for many people, money is all they know and it's all they want. For others, money is a means to an end. Now, either way we wish to look at it, the desire for money can and will often turn us into something or someone we were never intended to be. Now, another issue we find is within the church. There are many Bible-toting believers that are convinced that having money means you are blessed and highly favored, and not having money means that you have done something wrong or you are under some sort of curse. Many preachers and teachers have gone have done believers a disservice by convincing them that if they are believers, they should have wealth as some evidence of their prosperity. And what's even sadder is it's not just happening in the pew, but it's also happening from the pulpit. As, as I scan social media, I see more and more preachers marketing their wares. Buy my book. Come to my conference. Make me your life coach, and it'll only cost you so much money. There may be, they may be legitimate, and frankly, many of them are. However, there are some times when I wonder, is it about the money's money, or is it about the ministry? Uh, our text today shows two men, Elijah the prophet and his servant Gehazi. They, they've been traveling together for some time, and, and in this pericope, uh, we find them having left the presence of the Aramean general Naaman. And even though the Arameans fought off and on with the nation of Israel, Naaman had found favor with the God of Israel. He, he didn't even realize he had favor, but this favor is evidenced when a slave girl approaches him and says to him, uh, General Naaman, sir, we understand you're leprous, and we know that being a general, you know, you, you feel a little bit upset about that. So there is a man in Egypt, there is a prophet called Elisha, who could possibly heal you. 
So, so Naaman sends for Elijah. Elijah comes and, 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 and not only is Naaman healed, but Naaman is converted. He confesses who God is. He, he says, I, now I know you're the only God that I need to serve. And he's so grateful, he tries to give Elijah a gift, but Elijah flatly refuses the gift. However, Elijah's servant Gehazi, has, he has some other ideas. He, he devises a scheme to get something from Naaman. His, his thought process is, it was Naaman should give up something. He, he makes up a story he thought Naaman would believe starring two itinerant uh, prophets from Ephraim who were in need. And he receives two talents of silver, which if we convert it to modern day weights and measures, it equals 151 pounds of silver, which is worth about $57,648. Not a little bit of money. He then turns to Elijah, returns to Elijah as if nothing has happened. And if we read between the lines, we are led to believe that Gehazi was not going to share any of his ill-gotten gains with his master, with the man who had been helping him and teaching him all along the way. Gehazi received this money through a lie and was planning to keep it through a lie. This episode in the life of, of Gehazi is the personification of dishonest gain. And, and when we put the two men side by side, we see some glaring disparities between them, between them in the relationship of how they viewed what they were doing. Uh, you see, Elijah was not motivated by money, but Gehazi was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In our text, it, it, our text shows Gehazi's motivation. He, he wants to get paid for what has happened. And one of the saddest parts of the narrative is all Gehazi really does is carry messages back and forth. But he decides that, that he wants to, to get paid. He, he decides that he deserves something out of this deal. Elijah really does all the work, if you will. Now, frankly, it wasn't a whole lot of work because Elijah just gives him a simple message, dip seven times in the Jordan, and you'll be clean. And, and, and Elijah was not motivated by money. His motivation was ministry, or his motivation was serving the Most High God. He wanted to see this man named healed. He, he put a Aside any potential negative feelings about the Arameans. He put aside the fact that Naaman had delusions of grandeur. He, he put aside his personal agenda and he ministers to Naaman. Uh, he was not expecting any money from Naaman and if we read between the lines, he was more than likely commanded by God to not take anything. Uh, Gehazi, on the other hand, decides to profit from the prophet's actions. Not only does he decide the prophet, but he lies to the prophet, and he lies to keep the prophets. Gehazi's motivated by the thought of being able to have a substantial windfall on which he could live. He, he wanted to be in a position where he felt as though he would not have to rely on anyone. He, he saw flashes of how people would, uh, would treat him if he had a little bit of money, because even then, in the ancient world, money was status, just like it is today. He decided that if he had some money, people would see him a little bit differently. He would be a little bit better than the average servant. So he decides to concoct the story and get paid. And, and at this time, he's following an itinerant prophet all across the countryside. But he decides that if he's got some money, he, maybe he would beat somebody. That, and that's what being motivated by money looks like. Another stark difference between the two is Elijah was satisfied with God's provisions, but Gehazi was not. Elijah traveled for years with Elijah, and he saw what God did for Elijah. When Elijah picked up the mantle, he also picked up everything that came along with the mantle, including provisions that came from God. Prophets were itinerant. They, that means they traveled the countryside. They went from city to city, town to town, as they were led by God. Or maybe somebody may have sent a message that they needed healing or they had a problem that needed solving. But they would call the prophet. And the fact of the matter is there was no such thing as a prophet stipend. He did not have a housing allowance. He didn't have a travel budget. He had to rely on the God who called him and sent him. And God provided for him at every turn in his and, and, and faith told him that God would make sure he had what he needed. And sometimes it came from people such as the Shunammite woman who fed him and built a room onto her house for him. And when it came to be time to be protected as he traveled, he had angels that were sent from heaven to watch over him. He trusted God to provide for him and God's provisions were 
weren't enough. Mm. All right. And now let's look at Gehazi for a second. There is no mention of Gehazi until Elisha encounters the Shunammite woman. So we don't know much about him. But what we do find out is he is dissatisfied with the way God has been providing. Mm. How do we know this? He makes the statement to Elisha that, that Elisha let Naaman off too easy. Now, now, I believe firmly that if it were meant for Elisha to be paid by Naaman, God would have said so. God would have stopped him and said, go ahead and take that which Naaman is offering you. But Elisha was sent to Naaman so Naaman could become a believer, not a benefactor. All right, all right. Let me stop there for a minute. Too often in this world, uh, people who are serving, they're looking for benefactors. Mm -hmm. They're not looking for people to become believers. They're not looking for people to receive salvation. They want to know what's, uh, what's in it for me. The fact is you, that, that this day and time, the time is too short for us to be worried about trying to benefit from the kingdom. It's up to us to say, I'm going to go ahead and do this because God said it, not because I can get something out of it. Gehazi was, was disappointed. His disappointment uh, came because he was not satisfied with what God was giving him. And instead of going to his spiritual father, his mentor, to have a conversation about the situation and maybe find out why Elijah refuses to give, he takes the situation into his own hands. He lies to Naaman. He lies to Elijah. All because he is not satisfied with what God has given him. The final difference between the two is Elisha was not trying to take what he was not meant to have, but Gehazi was. When Elisha was offered a gift for healing Naaman, he immediately refused. And during the refusal, he invokes the name of God. It was very close to swearing by the name of God that he would not take anything from Naaman. He, 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 does it, he does not take it because this trip was not meant to be a lucrative venture. It was meant to be a mission trip. Now, how many people do you know go on a mission trip trying to make money? I'll let that sit there for a minute. We're not sure of his economic status, but just kind of knowing and understanding how prophets live, Elijah could have used some extra income, as all of us could. Uh, but he makes it clear he was not supposed to have this gift, so he declines it. As a servant of God, he knew and he understood where the line was to be drawn. Gehazi, on the other hand, even though he had been told we are not going to take this money, makes a conscious decision to take what was not meant for him, what he was not meant to have. He chose to satisfy himself as opposed to listening to the man of God that he served. He, Gehazi decided that he deserved something for his trouble. He, he was not focused on ministry, but he was focused on the money. His, his decision was based on his personal considerations. And this becomes a problem because he decided that even though he was told not to take it, he was going to take it anyway. He made a decision that he was going to grab something that was not meant for him. Now, now today as I close, I want everyone to think about this for a moment. And the question of today is, which person do you most resemble? Are you most like Elijah or are you more like Gehazi? Are, are you more like Elijah if you're in it to serve God's people? You are doing the work because you understand that there are people that need salvation. There are people that need to hear from heaven. There's somebody out there that needs to know Jesus saves. There's somebody out there that needs to know that God forgives and God will take them back in even when somebody else will not. There's somebody out there, there's some young man out there that needs to know he doesn't have to be in the game to find love. He doesn't have to be in the game to find consideration. But if he just comes to Jesus and does so now, and there's some young lady out there that needs to know that she doesn't have to have a boyfriend to, to show her self-esteem. She doesn't have to have a man in her life to prove that she is a strong black woman. All she needs is to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Are we about that ministry or are we about the money? Then there's some folk that act like their house and they got to get paid every time they come through the church door. They, 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 won't, they won't sign the contract unless you put some money up front. I, as much as I, I love and, 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 and appreciate the music of James Cleveland, I was once told that years ago for James Cleveland to even say he would think about coming to 
your venue, it would cost you $10,000, non-refundable deposit. All right. All right. All right. Now, I understand the man was a professional, but every once in a while, I just ask myself, is something like that really necessary? Because I wonder every once in a while, uh, are we in it for the ministry or are we in it for the money? Are we in this thing because we love the Lord or are we in this thing because we are all about the Benjamins? And I tell you today, if you're in it about the money, if you're in it for the money, then money has become your God. If you're in it for the money, the money is what you worship. But when you're in it for service, there'll be days you don't get paid. There'll be days you have to go home with a thank you and a handshake. There'll be days when somebody gives you a hug and says, I don't have a dime, but I appreciate everything you've done for me. There'll be days when somebody says, I can't pay you back, don't know when, but you do it not because you want the money, but you do it because you love the Lord. You do it because you're going out to talk to somebody about Jesus. Amen. 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 